Welcome to the Kings Beat Podcast. I am James Hamm, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. Joining me, Fox 40s, Sean Cunningham. Sean, how are you? Brendan James, I am fantastic. How are you folks? How are you kind folks today? We're good. We're good. Uh, and of course, You know why? It's the weather. It's like beautiful outside. <laughs> <laughs> Blame it on the weather. Uh, and we're welcoming back Brendan Nunes from the King's Pulse podcast. Brendan, you're back. How are you? I'm back. I'm doing good. My voice feels all right now and uh, have my energy back. So doing okay. How was, was your surgery? It was, you know, successful operation. Everything came out huh. clean. So, okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, cosmetic, Brendan, of, cosmetic, of course. Yeah. 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 Gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> Enhancements, enhancements. That's what we like to call them. Um, all right, uh, let's get to it. The Sacramento Kings. Um, yeesh. Uh, we keep having these moments with this team, right? Where you think they figured things out, you think that they've like gone down the right path, and then they they hit a roadblock. And uh, the San Antonio Spurs game. It was what was that on Sunday? Uh, yeah, it was Sunday. Sunday matinee. Um, we're going to talk about it today because the Kings are getting ready to face the uh, New Orleans Pelicans tonight, followed by uh, back-to-back with the Dallas Mavericks. But it's one of those like thuds that hit the floor that we kind of hope that we were past. But just where, where are you guys at with this team? Because they have these moments where they show you something that is alarming. Uh, they show that they can be a co- an overconfident bunch when there's a game not really worth getting up for at times. And I think Mike Brown knocked it out of the park with his honest assessment after the Spurs lost, saying maybe we need to be hit in the head. Maybe we had some – I don't know where their mindset was at, but maybe there were some people who – and I'm, I'm going to generalize here – but were overconfident uh, that thought that they could just flip a switch, and they almost did. They almost flipped a switch and, and closed out that game fine. Um, but – San Antonio had other plans. So um, it's kind of why when we were projecting why I looked at the grouping of two games in Portland followed by the early game uh, against the Spurs and said, yeah, I could see them losing one of those. I didn't think I honestly didn't think it would be the Spurs game. I thought it might have been a shorthanded game where maybe they may they rest some guys. Um, But nevertheless, you kind of take the grouping and you go, "Okay, you went you won two of three. Um, you, you look at the, uh, you, you look at the grouping ahead with the Pelicans and, and Mavericks and yeah, maybe you drop one of those and maybe you drop one of the remaining games between the, the Warriors and the Nuggets. Uh, and I think that's kind of a fun way to look at it because it's, it's realistic. It doesn't get your hopes outside your skis there. And, and, and at the same time, you know, you're, you're just fine. You know, you finish off just fine. It won't get you the 50 wins, but it definitely gets you close enough to where it's respectable. Uh, you still finish higher than anybody has ever thought that this season would go. And you enter the playoffs remarkably steady. And I think that's uh, probably the hope as they close this out. Yeah, I mean, I think if shots go down at their more typical rate, that they probably could have just walked through that San Antonio game. But to Sean's point and, and kind of echoing what Coach had said, you shouldn't just be walking through games against any NBA team, really. And, you know, this is only 26% from three. I feel like we've seen it happen more often than I would expect recently. And in the three games this year, or I'm sorry, 13 games this year, they've shot under 30%. They now are three and ten, or three and 10 in those games. And that's just a product of relying fully on your offense. And sometimes shots aren't going to fall and you have to be able to be better defensively. I, I know that this team obviously lacks defensive talent and like just versatility length on the wing specifically, but like San Antonio shouldn't be a team that you have a problem with, even if you are a poor defensive like talent when it comes to your roster, 58 points in the paint. San Antonio is hitting more shots, but you also kind of fouled them. The 15 turnovers I thought was an issue. So I think it's just more so of the, this team is not good on defense as we've known. And you can't have a night where shots are not falling and you're still not able to, play decent defense against a team that is one of the worst in the league. This was their 20th win on the year. Yeah. 20th win. And you know, no Keldon Johnson, no Devin Vassell. They traded Yaka Pertle. Like this team isn't good. And you know, what was it? Julian, uh, Champagne. No, Champagne. Champagne. Okay. Yeah. 
No, no I, Jeremy Sohan either, by the way. Oh yeah, no, and no Sohan. Okay, but like, uh, Champagny came in with his career high was twelve, and he had twenty two at the half. I yep. mean, that's just unacceptable. And you I knew know, that I'm was going to happen, though, right? I mean, there, there was there was so many. Yeah, someone was going to do it. Uh, there was a bunch of relatively unknowns. So why not Champagny? Well, as my phone goes off, sorry about that. That was uh, both yeah, of I mean, our phones, so uh, all right. Well, it must be good news. <laughs> Justin Min, uh, Minaya, 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 Minaya. Uh, is getting a, is getting pulled up to the Trailblazers. Thanks, Woj, for for sending us that alert. Um, yeah, I, like you just can't keep having these moments, though. Like I guess it's late in the season. We shouldn't be uh, like looking too much at, at like what's happening because they've already clinched their playoff spot. They've almost clinched the number three seed in the in the Western Conference. Their a game, their magic number to, to clinch the Pacific is one. Still, all they need is one game, and they they clinch the Pacific. And so you're kind of like waiting for these things to happen. I think the biggest disappointment for this team, though, is that these oopses seem to happen on their home court. And it's something that I think really came up during post-game conversations. Um, and I was digging into the numbers. Like, we keep popping out this stat, you know, that the Kings, uh, their defensive rating at home is like 29th in the NBA. Their defensive rating on the road is like 9th. Um, and that seems really strange to have a, a split like that. But then I, I looked at their offensive and defensive ratings, like both of them combined. So their home... Offensive rating is 122.2 with a 118.2 uh, defensive rating. So their net rating is plus four. And then their road record, uh, their road rating is 115.8 offensive and 113.8 defensive rating. So almost like five points better uh, defensively, but their net rating is only a plus two. So it seems like that they just play a slower pace or a, more straight up game as opposed to like the highs and lows that we're getting at home. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think shots falling too, I'd imagine is part of that. I'd, I'd have to look at the three point percentage numbers uh, splits between home and road, but I feel like typically more, more of the road players are going to be able to hit shots more so in their own building, I'd imagine. And when you're just doing more on offense, I think you feel more comfortable taking your foot off the gas a little bit on defense. You don't like as you're not as focused on the little details there as that's kind of what we've seen more so on the road from them. So, but it, it is something that's absolutely concerning heading into postseason when, you know, it's like part of the reason being in this three seat is so good is you have home court advantage, but are you going to be able to take advantage of that? And hey, look, I think, Demonis Sabonis said it best, and you know, in referencing the Spurs game, called it a trap game. They're not really panicked over the way they play on the road and versus home. I think certainly what they show when they play on the road is a a bigger focus because of they either practice when they land, they there there's a much more attention to detail, and I think that bodes well even for a playoff series at home because of the fact that you're going to have some days off to prepare for your opponent. And you're going to have days in between games to prepare for your opponent and make adjustments. So I think that's where this Kings team f thrives, is the having the attention to detail, having the room to do it in a, in a more um, regimented and, and kind of balanced uh, style as opposed to some trap games where you're playing you know three games in four nights and you go up some personnel that you may not know that much about. And let's face it, there's a pressure uh, that's just been absolutely off their shoulders since clinching the division or the division clinching the playoff spot. So um, I think it was expected that there'd be some let up. And I think, look, we're seeing how many minutes did Alex Len get? We normally don't see that. So I think you're starting to see some minutes for other guys just to really round out the season. I, I still somewhat expect to see a, a day or two where there's a another another game where someone sit a game where someone sits or uh you find rest opportunities uh, going in but nevertheless you may not need to do that just on the balance of minutes and because you're going to have several days to um to, to really prepare for whatever lies ahead in terms of opponent for uh this off season or for this uh, postseason run coming up and it's funny because man that that western conference everybody below you just changes on a daily basis 
Oh, it's a mess. The yeah, bottom man. is a mess. I mean, the Kings have no idea who they're going to play at all. I mean, it could be the Clippers. It could be the Pelicans. It could be the Warriors. It, I mean, it's all over the board. The Lakers are right there again. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into a deeper dive into what the, the bottom of the West looks like. Uh, and, and, you know, Sean, you brought up something, you know, like the Alex Len situation. It's, like, strange. Like, I, I got to be honest. Like, we watched a guy sit on the bench for, um, you know, months and months and months. He played 58 minutes through, like, the first 72 games, and all of a sudden he's played, like, right around 58 minutes over the last four games. And I think it's interesting what we're seeing as far as, like, Mike Brown shift gears and give somebody an opportunity that hadn't been given an opportunity. Uh, but what I would point out is that during against the Spurs, 39 minutes for Sabonis, 38 minutes for Fox, 37 and a half minutes for Harrison Barnes, 36 minutes for Kevin Herter, 35 minutes for Keegan Murray. Like Mike Brown doesn't seem to be letting off the gas here. And we got, you know, again, a back to back here with uh, the Pelicans and the Mavs. If the Mavs cash it in, you know, sure, that game might become easy, but I don't think they're going to. I think they're they're a game out of the playoffs or the play-in, and they would probably still like to be in there. And then the last two games of the season have meaning. Maybe not for the Nuggets, maybe the last game of the season. So my point would be, like, it doesn't look like Mike Brown is letting off the gas, and I'm kind of of the opinion that Mike Brown shouldn't let off the gas, that he shouldn't be resting players because you you don't want to go into the playoffs with a five game losing streak. That's not something that would be good for this team at all. In my opinion, like maybe I'm off, but even if you're resting players, losing five straight would be a, would be a big deal for me. Yeah. You definitely I mean, sorry. don't want to go in with a losing streak. I also think that if anybody has slight lingering stuff, like obviously you, I, I think that's the situation where you rest and maybe try to limit some guys minutes here and there. Um, and, and when it comes to Alex Len, I think that's more so like testing something, right? Rather than giving other guys rest, that's trying to figure out, can this guy play in, because maybe in certain matchups you do need him. Maybe you need a big body against Jokic when Domas sits for six minutes. Um, I, I think we've seen Alex Len earlier in the year against Denver. So I feel like that's more so just kind of testing things. And I actually think the biggest deal to me in that loss to San Antonio is you kind of had a chance to sneak to that two spot. Possibly they would have been one game behind because Memphis had lost against Chicago that same day. And, you know, only three, four games left for both those teams. Who knows if you would have been able to pull it off, but I, I thought that was one of the more disappointing aspects of that loss to San Antonio. Yeah. And I don't, I don't disagree with any of that. Uh, what you said, James either. Cause, um, it's probably not the right move. And I think, you know, he probably would have, um, I'm talking about Mike Brown, would have rested some guys in terms of not rest, but just found some lighter minutes had the game not gone it the way it did. And I think he was not, I don't think he intended to, to play guys that way. You look at the game before that, and granted it was a rel relatively lopsided win. Guys didn't have to play really mo much more than 30, 33 minutes, I think, it, at least for the core people. And, uh yeah, I think it was more of a just as a testament as to way as to the way the game was going, and he left, you know, the fourth quarter kind of speak for itself. He left some of the guys out there for a long time to bring it back, and Sabonis had it rolling too in that fourth quarter. Finally, against a team, a Spurs team that had no business limiting him the way that they did for the amount of three quarters and frustrating him with foul trouble, uh, he finally kind of got things going in the fourth. So um, I, I do agree with you. Like, yeah, I mean, there might be a moment where. I could see it both ways, and 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 honestly, finding rest, finding moments of 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 just breathers for these guys could go a long way. But at the same time, you don't want to take your foot off the gas, and I completely understand that philosophy. And that's kind of been the philosophy that Mike Brown has rolled with all season long. Why why make a difference now? My only th my only thought there and pushback would be you run the risk of, of really running these guys into the ground just as the second season is getting going. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I, I'm sure there's not a lot of people that are expecting a huge, you know, uh, multi-round playoff run from these Kings. Could happen, maybe not. But these potentially, these, the, the playoffs can go two and a half months. So, um, you know, it, 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 is, it is fun to see the strategy behind it. But there, I, I also believe that there is enough rest and enough time in between games to where you can really – uh, 
get yourself the appropriate amount of R and R before you play a game, and you have time to put your attention to detail, uh, and that you you don't really get afforded that in the regular season. There's no back to backs in the playoffs, so uh, things are spaced out, and things should be uh, relatively good to go with this team who has had the good fortune of health for the better part of the season. Yeah, and of course, we bring up health. We might as well mention Malik Monk is questionable with uh, what is a lower left leg, uh, like a mild strain from what I've heard. Um, I'm not sure what exactly that is because like there's a lot of different muscles in the lower left leg, just like there is in the lower right leg. Uh, but uh, it's one of those things that um, they're going to be a little cautious. I would... I would not be surprised if Malik Monk misses the back-to-backs here, um, and and I would actually be very surprised if if we see him before this coming, for uh, the Warriors and um, and Nuggets at the end of the season, if at all, like in these last in the last week of the season, um, you want to be cautious with stuff like that. And if he's got something, you know, we've seen it with Fox, we've seen it with Herder, like these little bumps and bruises, these little uh, tweaks, if you will, uh, late in the season. And again, Malik Monk is a player um, just like Fox. Like they've never played meaningful minutes and uh, meaningful games in the last twenty games of the season, and it, it, that's something that they have not had to go this deep into the season where the gas, you, you know, your foot has to be on the gas the whole time. And I, you know, maybe they're they're wearing out a little bit, and they could use a breath uh, a breath to kind of catch. Uh, get their legs underneath them and, and kind of propel themselves towards the second season. Um, 19 points in the overtime session for the Spurs, uh, but also 142 points for the game. Uh, Mike Brown is like, I, I, he's just beating his head against a wall here with this group and their inability to play defense consistently. What do you guys make of that? So like Brendan, like I know you look at all the advanced numbers like I do and like there's something that is missing from this team. And we talked about the road and home splits. That's one thing. But I think Mike Brown made the the really like loud point that this is the same exact scheme that he's been using his whole career. And it always works. There's always, you know, last season in Golden State, he had the number two rated defense in the NBA with Draymond Green missing half the season with Steph Curry, you know, being Steph Curry and not a great defender, with Klay Thompson coming back off a major knee surgery and not being Klay Thompson, and he was still able to piece that together. Like, what do you make of that part of it? Because Mike Brown seems to be really frustrated with the fact that this group still this deep into the season just doesn't get it and and can get beat by a team with literally no true NBA starter at all, and they can give up 142 points. I think it's personnel you know I, I hate to just write it off that easily but it's a combination of like there's not much perimeter containment there's no real rim protection and there's no defensive versatility from like wings forwards you know I, I think the most common issue that we see is Sabonis gets involved in the pick and roll and then therefore the guy on the weak side needs to sink in and take care of the big that Domas is helping off of. And sometimes that's Malik Monk. Sometimes that's Kevin Herter. Sometimes that's Keegan Murray. And I don't think that those guys do a very good job of being willing to come in and deal with that physicality of a guy that much bigger than them. Like Herter and Monk obviously have size disadvantages and like disadvantages. I think Murray like sometimes looks a little allergic to physicality or just like, I think he needs, still needs to, I, I think it's something that will totally be an adjustment throughout the course of his career, but I think it looks like typical rookie stuff to me, maybe just half a second late or getting used to the physicality size length that is in the NBA. Um, and the perimeter containment, I, I do think is a big one. I think that De'Aaron needs to be better there. We have seen him be better in fourth quarters, but he's primarily the guy that you're asking to do that as the head of the snake and the one, usually guarding the the player with the ball there. It's a lot of it. I, I hate to just say like it's it's personnel because I do think these guys can be better, but I, I don't think that this is a roster that you like look at and is like they are going to be a top 
20 defensive team. Like that's what you hope for. I think that there's nights that you can get that, but personnel wise, it, it just hasn't clicked. Has there really been that many instances this season where they've shown that they can be a good defensive team? Maybe like a quarter, I think back to like that Cleveland game on the road. I think they played a great fourth quarter defensively, but there's not many instances I can really think of where I'm like, wow, they played great defense there for 20 minutes. And and that was actually my question after the game. It was like, you know, you suck defensively, but how much of an outlier was this game? I mean, Keegan. I mean, you mentioned Keegan. There are moments where he felt like he was on an island, like as if the basketball game was taking place, and yet he was on a different island away from where the court was. the The amount of backdoor uh, action that you saw. Um, I know that sounded dirty, but the amount of backdoor action you saw that they just got beat on constantly. Uh, it happened, I think, a lot in the second quarter. Um, you, you really saw it happen again in the in the second half. Um, but I can think of just several moments that almost seemed in succession, really, where the backdoor action was, was really killing the Kings. And um, I, I, feel, I also feel like, you know, look, you mentioned Fox again. You have a you have a team that is not good defensively, and it is personnel, right? But when you have a team that ultimately is mailing it in and, and doesn't give a damn, that's going to look entirely worse, and it did. Um, I think what the the common theme, though, and, and you've pointed out some good points of, of not having rim protection, uh, perimeter defense. I would I would argue transition defense is sometimes the the one where i can you can kind of see improvements um from uh, from game to game because uh, if you're getting beaten transition a lot or they you know they've got all the fast break points and the kings don't um that will tend to vary sometimes there's games where just the opposition misses shots and that gets credited as good defense um i think the team knows they have analytics for what's a good shot and what's a bad shot and what was contested and all that but putting all that aside the most common theme with this team, and they tell on themselves, I mean, Fox will call themselves a finesse team. They are a finesse team. He, he said it time and time again this season. Mike Brown will turn that into they don't play with physicality. And I think that, to me, is the more alarming part of the entire defensive structure as a whole for the season's sample size. And that's obviously the biggest concern going into the playoffs because you want to play with physicality, play with physicality without fouling. But you were hoping to see throughout the course of the season that this team plays with an edge defensively. And 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 they really don't. You know, they're just trying to get through three to four minute stretches. Can you get through moments where Maybe the team has gone on a seven to eight to nine oh run, and how do you respond offensively? Um, I think that ends up being sometimes well they'll say good defense leads to good offense. I think in this case, offense tends to help their defense. So um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's an evolution with this team. It's not one that's trending the right way as they go into the postseason from a defensive standpoint. And let's just face it, they just don't play with that that edge. They have a fortitude about them. They have a competitive nature. And sometimes that does come to a, a peak in the fourth quarter. I think sometimes it, you see nice stretches, but uh, for the entirety of a game, it's, it's rather defense is basically on a milk carton for the most part. Yeah. Okay, so if you are watching on YouTube uh, and you don't mind, give us a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe if you're not a subscriber here to the king's beat podcast on youtube uh if you're listening on any other platform and you don't mind give us a rating and review those things help um and and thanks for tuning into the king's beat uh, we didn't do this at the beginning of the show which is strange but uh jump on board with the king's uh become a subscriber become a premium subscriber to the king's beat um and and all that stuff so uh sean brought up a couple of points there that i want to i want to look at and First of all, I don't have the numbers in front of me where the Kings are transition D Y, uh, transition D wise, but um, they're not bad in transition defense. Uh, where where they are bad is as offensive rebounders, and so I saw it early in the season where Mike Brown realized that their transition defense was horrible, and that was because he had his wings crashing from the corners to go get offensive rebounds, 
And that's not the case anymore. He's like, hey, we're not doing that anymore. You guys don't get that privilege. You have to get back and play defense. Um, and so I, I think the Kings transition defense has been, for the most part, every once in a while you have a game where you're like, oh, this is not good, right? Um, but Cleaning I, the glass has them fifth in least points per possession in transition defense. Yeah, so they're good, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and then offensive rebounding wise, uh, you can look that up too, but uh, it's it's bad. Um, they are one of the worst offensive rebounding teams in the NBA. And uh, I, I think I even have it here, um, offensive rebounds per game. Uh, they're 25th. Um, and, you know, they're so they're in the bottom five in offensive rebounds. Uh, it's something that they had to, like, give up one thing to make another thing work. Now, I, I think we keep looking at, like, road and home splits, but if you dig into individual games, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, the Kings are so bad defensively early in games, and they get better as the game goes on. And, like, you look at their their net rating in the third and fourth quarter, they're spectacular. I think this team makes adjustments better than any team that I've covered in the last 13 seasons. Like they make halftime adjustments, whether it's like conversations or whether it's slight tweaks to schematic things or uh, players who don't get another shot in the second half, whatever it is. But what do you guys make of that? Because I think that's what, where Mike Brown has to be like the most frustrated. It's like, it's not that this team cannot play defense. It's that they almost choose not to in specific times. Like they don't come out with force in the first quarter. Second quarter can be the same. Third quarter, they pummel people. Fourth quarter, the game slows down and they're one of the better defensive teams in the league. Like they're, what are they, number nine in fourth quarter uh, defensive rating? So like we talk about the fact that they're a bad defensive team, but how do you make heads or tails of the fact that they're just a, not a good defensive team for 48 minutes. <laughs> million dollar sure. question, right? Sure. <laughs> no, I, I, it, it's the million dollar question. Cause I think Mike Brown's trying to figure that out. You know, this team just has a personality of one that can, can turn either turn it on at one moment, go lackadaisical at the next. It's, it's all keeping the focus, the engagement, uh, the, the give a damn. And, it, like I said, that that's the it's it's they're consistently inconsistent, and I would say consistently just bad def- on the defensive end. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's a remedy. I don't think there's a magic bean. I don't know what the, what the solution is, but <laughs> they got to find it, man. They got to find it. Yeah, I don't really get it either. I think that there's possessions where they do embrace the physicality a little bit more. You see guys they are taking charges or instead of flying by actually holding their ground and going vertical and attempting to contest. Like I feel like once or twice a game, you'll see De'Aaron apply some ball pressure and get a steal and get a bucket on the other end. So I I don't really know why you see moments of it. And it seems like that is kind of what the coaching staff is holding on to. You know, I I think whenever question is presented, like, is that frustrating or, um, more so something that you can look to for a sense of optimism. It seems to be a combination of bo- both, but almost more so the latter that like we've shown we can do it, but I don't know. I, I tend to agree with Sean that this team is just bad defensively more often than not. And every once in a while, you'll get a couple possessions in a row where they get some stops. And when you're the best offense of all time, I guess that's all it takes to really extend your lead or, or try to cut into the opposing team's lead. But It's got to be more than that. Like this is by far the biggest concern we've had all year long. I don't think we've seen it get much better and it's going to be the biggest thing headed into the postseason. It's why Mike Brown said, if I was other teams, I would target us too when it comes to a first round matchup. Yeah. I mean, I think first round is one thing. It's when you get deeper, the second, the third round that I think defense becomes even more and more glaring Um, because that first round you're still playing against I mean, let's be honest. The, the Kings are at 47 and 31 in the third seed in the West. That's not typically where a third seed is. They usually have five or six more wins at this point. Um, but the bottom of the West, like all of these teams are competing right at the 500 level. Like this is typically like eight, nine seed. And we're seeing that from the like five, six, seven 
8, 9, 10, 11 seed. They're all bunched up around the same spot. And I think it, like at this point, we have no idea who the Kings are going to play in the playoffs at all. Like there's not even a, like a way to project at all. Like the Clippers are and and Warriors are 41 and 38. The Lakers are half game back at 40 and 38 and they're tied with the Pelicans who are also 40 and 38. Then you got 39 and 40 with the Timberwolves, 38 and 41 with OKC and then the the uh, Mavericks are on the outside looking in at 37 and 42. Like all of these teams still there's I think there are what three or four games left in the season for most of these teams. And all of from five to 10 are separated by three games. And, and really like five to eight are all within a half game of each other. Um, Just what do you make of that? Just how bad this season has been as far as like for like across the board, like the, the Western conference, sure. It's got a really good team at the top and, and then a, a team that's been through all kinds of ups and downs and then in, at number two, and then an inexperienced team at number three. After that, it's just like a bunch of craziness and wildness. Where at least the, the Eastern Conference has like a standard pecking order that you that we've relied on for years and years in the NBA. Well, and and to that point, like how many of those teams, many of which have terrific post game experience, how many of them? are of the belief that just get us to the playoffs, just get us in the postseason. We turn it on. Uh, we, you know, we'll rely on our, our physicality. We'll rely on our experience. Um, I, I, cause I, I look at, you know, these are teams that when they make off season uh, pickups, it's like, Oh, that, that player will suit you well in the postseason. or this, this player might get you, might be your, your regular season guide, get you the regular season, and and give some of your stars time to come around and i think for a lot of them you know we're seeing use the clippers for example you've seen obviously they're without paul george right now <clears throat> they've had Kawhi leonard you know out for various moments of the season obviously wasn't playing back to backs but a guy who struggled with injury and availability is certainly in question and you know, I think right around this time they're hoping to have they've got Kawhi Leonard and he's rolling, and and for the most part that's true. But then Paul George goes out, so right as the right at the moment that they were hoping to ramp up and really fortify a, a playoff position, look, they're still outside the play-in tournament, so that's a good thing for them. But they're not far removed from it, and they've got you look just look at the Clippers. You got home Lakers, home Portland, and then you're at Phoenix. Um, you know, if they go two and two out of those three, I think they'll be just fine. Um, Warriors. You look at their remaining schedule. Obviously, they got the Thunder. They're going to host the Thunder. They've got at Kings on Friday, and then they're at Portland. So that looks to me like a either a three three game win streak, maybe a two of three. If they go two of three, they're going to be just fine. And then the Clippers have the tiebreaker over them. So Clippers five, Warriors six. And if that's how it stands, buckle up, Northern California. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be yeah, driving I, to games, <laughs> which I I don't hate that idea from our perspective, um, but. There is no dominating force in the West, but I think another way you can look at it is there's not very many bad teams. There's three bad teams, Houston, San Antonio, and Portland, right? And then after that, like, I actually think that maybe some of these records have to do with more often than not, you're going up against another solid team. Like Utah was better than expected. OKC was better than expected. And there's been different times where each of these teams have been rolling. Minnesota's kind of rolling right now, or I'm sorry, New Orleans is rolling right now. There was a time earlier in the year where they were towards the top of the standings and then ended up taking a fall. Um, I, I totally agree with, with Sean's point that some of these teams are more focused on the postseason than the regular season. And I, I think as they should be. So I think it's been fun and there's just no like dominating teams. And I, I think the parody is, has been good for the league. I, I think that again, it's, been fun and it's made these last few weeks definitely very entertaining there's a game every single night that has big standing implications and, and can i point out too real quick i mean I, I had to write this down so if you're looking at four through ten as it currently sits as we record this on tuesday at two almost two o'clock in the afternoon uh we go suns clippers warriors and the play-in tournament is it's seven through ten is is lakers pelicans t wolves thunder i already showed you how the clippers and the warriors have three games remaining the suns at four lakers seven and and pelicans eight they're the only teams that have four games remaining while Clippers, Warriors, T-Wolves, Thunder have three games remaining. So there is ground to be made. If, if even if like 
there's ground to be made, but they all have to, they all control their own destiny. They all have to um, essentially take care of business. But the one thing that's, that really stands out to me is the Lakers, because I just told you about the Warriors and the Clippers. They don't really have outside of like, you know, like Clippers playing the Suns, who cares? That's, that's it. That's incestuous at that point. Clippers and Lakers, a little bit different. I think Lakers, Clip, that's going to be a must win for both teams. But the Lakers and the Pelicans are two teams that are playing teams that they need to beat head-to-head matchups. Where the Lakers have to beat, they got Utah twice, they're out of the picture, but they're surrounded by Clippers and Phoenix. Like, they, in my opinion, they need to win three of those four. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. They have to win three out of four. But, Pel- but what yeah. does that mean? If they win three well, out of four, are you talking to, to avoid the plan? Possibly. Possibly, like I say, regardless, because of how everything's so jumbled up there, you need there's head-to-head matchups at stake with the Clippers and the and the and the Suns. Um, you know, two games with Utah, they need to absolutely crush them, uh, and it starts with that Utah. Uh, so, but but point being is, you've got four games as opposed to where the majority of your other the teams surrounding you have three games. You know, like you have an you have added opportunity to really improve your position or to bolster your position and i don't know that there is any bolstering of positions when you're you know so jumbled up and play in tournament but they could they could feasibly see one of the warriors or the clippers fall back into the play in tournament and the lakers might keep their head above the fray hmm yeah i i mean it's wild I, like i don't know who you want to play but also like we talked about uh dallas dallas is they're a game out, right? And right. they only have three games left, but their three games are the Kings who are on the second night of a back-to-back and might not care about that game. And then the Bulls and the Spurs. So I'm not counting them out either of the play. No. And well, and the OK Pelicans, season. yeah, the, the Pelicans who the Kings will play tonight. I mean, you're talking about the, they're going to start of the four games. Again, they're another team that has four games remaining. They're three of them are at home. They've got, this starts Kings, Memphis, Knicks, and then they go at T wolves. Oh, that's tough, though. <laughs> yeah, you've got three teams that are just all hovered in the West. You got to control your own destiny. Obviously, the Timberwolves have lost Nas Reed. Uh, that's not going to be good for them. Uh, they they're in the ninth right now. Timberwolves, man, they're going to go at Brooklyn, at Spurs, and then obviously they've got the Pelicans at that final game. Only three games remaining. What if they fall out of the playing tournament? And Dallas like is the one that jumps in. That's wild. Yeah, man, this is crazy. Chaos. So if you're, if Dogs, you're still cats following along together yeah man <laughs> yeah no I, I think it's in it's entertaining right this is what the nba was hoping for when they developed the play in tournament and I, I think the play in tournament is doing exactly what you you hoped it would do it, it's like kept teams engaged it's uh lesson tanking like we're we're still looking at a team like okc like shouldn't you be tanking you look at uh utah it's not like the Lakers are some world-beating team. If Utah played their players, Utah could easily jump right back into this thing. They're not that far down the list. I don't think they want to. I think they want to be in the lottery more than they want to be, which is why we've seen them bench marking in and, uh, and you know, who else? Uh, Jordan Clarkson and Colin, Colin Sexton. Sexton yeah. yeah, so. Well, and it's funny, like, in the East – which seems like an afterthought at this point. No one really cares, but there's not really a whole lot of intrigue. Like it's Miami, two games outside of the play uh, of, of being outside of Brooklyn at six, Miami, Atlanta, Toronto, and Chicago. And everything's rather spaced out. Like seven to 10 is three games, but 10 to 11 is like four games. So (laughs) it it did it like the play in tournament isn't nearly as uh, intriguing over there because nobody's jumbled up. But like this is a way it, to I, I illustrate that to show that like just because the play-in tournament exists and yes it's created some more opportunity it can still be rather mundane and and it as example by what's happening in the East. Okay, yeah, and, and I mean like looking at the the East, the play-in tournament is all but set. The only team that has an outside shot, which I'm not sure why they have an outside. Well, I guess Washington doesn't have tiebreakers against Chicago. That must be what it is. But Orlando at 34 and 44, they're not eliminated from the play-in yet. And with four games left, um, they're four games behind Chicago. So they'd have to win out and Chicago would have to lose out. Um, yeah, it, it I, I don't know. This is uh, It's an entertaining season, I guess. I have a lot more faith in the Eastern Conference than I do the Western Conference. 
Um, but then again, I, I don't think that anyone wants to play anyone in the in the West. That's like you're for some reason you're afraid of each of these individual teams for whatever reason. And people who aren't fearing the Kings, sure they don't have experience at all, but they're still better than most of these teams. Just like they are better teams than them. The Kings have look at their conference record. I think that's one of the things that I'd point to. The Kings' conference record is excellent. They've they've been really solid, not just in their division, or they have a nine and six record, but their conference record is thirty one and seventeen, which means that they've feasted on their own people and like and we can't even point to like the teams that they have lost to, like the Jazz. They've lost to the Jazz. You know that's one of their 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 losses. So even like for the most part, the Kings have been really competitive against the teams around them. So I don't know why everyone is thinking that, oh, we'll just walk in and sm- uh, smack around the Kings um, outside of experience. But then again, like what kind of experience do you really think that New Orleans or Minnesota has? And it's not that much. Yeah. I think it's definitely, you know, Phoenix, Clippers, Golden State, Lakers when it comes to experience, right? And I, I think the other side that you could point to is that the Kings are 27 and 10 against teams below 500, which is great. They're actually a below 500 team against teams that are above 500. They're 20 and 21 in those scenarios, which is not great. And I think the other reason that teams circle the Kings is they're 25th in defense. The only teams worse, and I know we've already touched on the defense, but I think it's crazy to me that the only teams worse than the Kings on defense when it comes to defense rating are the Indiana Pacers, the Portland Trailblazers, the Detroit Pistons, the Houston Rockets, the San Antonio Spurs. So basically Ouch. the five worst teams in, in the NBA. The only other team in the bottom 10 defensively that is even in the play-in is the Atlanta Hawks. Hmm. 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 Yeah, but I, I, I would flip the thing and say, if we look at net rating, the Kings are seventh in the league in net rating. Yeah. which means that whatever they do on the defensive end, they make up for on the offensive end, um, which is, it, it's bizarre. I, I don't know how to judge this team. I, I still don't. Like, I, I know that they're they're good. They've proven they're good. They, you know, they've got to this point where they're a playoff team, where they're going to host a playoff series, all of these things. Um, I don't know. When it comes to, let's just... Uh, <laughs> what? I'm laughing because uh, I, I was on I was on the radio last night and or yesterday, and I used an analogy of uh, they're very attractive with not much personality. And it, it's that's or there's just nothing upstairs, you know, like maybe you just all all beauty, no brains. I don't know what it is, but it's it's the they it's what's keeping substance? them from it's what what's saying? keeping them from being the overall 10. Right. Like you said, the net rating, you're a seven. Yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> but seven out of 30. That, well, I was going off of 10, but yeah. That's not bad, Sean. <laughs> yeah, no, 7 out of 30 is awful. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, yeah, uh, what do you guys... Uh, we talked about this before. Um, like it, it feels like Mike Brown, like even the other coaches are coming out and supporting Mike Brown's candidacy for Coach of the Year. Pretty solid. Pretty much a lock. I know, Sean, yeah. you, you wavered on this early, but at this point... <laughs> well, I, I also ra- wavered when the team had 37 wins as opposed to where they're at now. So I just made arguments for other people, said how why I was looking more at how I thought Mike Budenholzer, in my estimation, had it kind of locked up. But all the while made the caveat that I think he will win, and I think he is the lock uh, because of just the way people and how they vote like it ends up being kind of like who's the biggest surprise and that ends up kind of ultimately winning out every year and he's the biggest surprise he's also um the 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 best storyline and he's probably the most impactful at this at this moment uh you could certainly argue that i mean i'm not taking anything away from mike brown it's it's to me it's him or budenholzer at this point and uh yeah that that's kind of where it stands i i I would imagine that you, that um, it will probably be as close to unanimous as, as we've seen in recent years. Brendan? I think the same. I, I think that a lot of these guys, like obviously there is a lot of credit to the roster and the roster building. And, you know, maybe Monty McNair will get some acknowledgement for that uh, 
possible award yeah. as well, executive of the year. Um, so I think that deserves acknowledgement for sure. But I think that a lot of these players are better because they are under Mike Brown and the rest of this coaching staff. I think that we've seen him unlock a lot of these players, optimize a lot of these guys. You could think of Trey Lyles earlier in the year when it came to defensive rebounding and having a quick trigger from three. You could think of Keegan Murray when it came to driving to the basket and rebounding. You know, he's he's challenged a lot of these guys and they've responded well. Um, so I think he's made a lot of these players better and a big reason the Kings have outperformed expectations, although not the only reason. And I, I think that Missoula stood out to me a lot at the beginning of the year. I think Taylor Jenkins is a good shout for somebody that's managed to keep his team stable through a lot of different injuries, which I think is similar to Sean's argument for Budenholzer. Um, so I think there's other guys that, you know, deserve, again, some acknowledgement. But I do think that Mike Brown is the runaway favorite for a good reason. Yeah, there's a great clip. Um, I was going to pull it for the pod and, and drop it in here, but that always becomes an issue with like rights and all that stuff. But uh, Mark, is it Dagnalt uh, from OKC, yeah. uh, who I, I think a lot of people believe should be in, in the running as well. He had this brilliant, like someone asked him and he said, oh, I already voted Mike Brown. He's like, and he, he went on like some really, really interesting things. He, he said like, look, that that is a, a place where like people have feared going because of the way the culture and everything else he's like it, it's not a job that a lot of people will take and I, I just thought it was really like profound the way he described it he's like he's rebuilt a culture on the fly his positive energy is something that he is, his team feeds off of you can see it um, and just the job he's done there is just like phenomenal not just because they've been bad forever, but because like that's not a job that people want to risk their their livelihood on. Like going to Sacramento is always like he is like changed the way people think about going to Sacramento. And I, I thought it was it was interesting. So I, I like looked that one up because I I thought it was a really good interview. But we're seeing like everyone like Mark Jones is polling the audience everywhere he goes and every head coach he's talking to is saying um, you know, Mike Brown, coach of the year. Uh, and of course, uh, he might actually be like Mark Jones might actually be like, you know, paying them off. It's possible because that's Mark. He, he's out there like, like, you know, stumping for his guy, trying to get everybody in uh, that he can. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion at this point that Mike is. And for those of us who have got to cover Mike all year long, like I said it early in the season, man, I really hope they, they're good because if we get to cover this uh this mike brown it's gonna be a lot of fun i've had a good time with him like being as a head coach i you know and like i get along with almost every head coach they've had um except for george carl which you know that's a whole nother story um but outside of that like usually like we get along pretty well with coaches but mike has been a little different and i think he's also been like vulnerable at times he's also uh, like he's taken time to thank the media and do different things, which I thought was unique. Um, but overall, just like the experience of Mike Brown this year has been fun. And I hope that this is something that where they're building something and that they can, this might be something that we see for a couple of years where he's building something. And I think that that would be interesting as well to get to cover Mike Brown, um, like sort of the character that is Mike Brown for multiple seasons, if this is actually going to you know, be the start. Well, I guess that would the, be the question. Go ahead. The, well, I'll say this: like, uh, yeah, we we saw what it looked like when um, they started the season zero and four. Granted, you have a lot of season, so there's no time to panic at that point, or no reason to panic at that point. But there were some people who, within the organization, <laughs> who uh, may have puckered up a little bit and and you know had some thoughts as to whether or not, hey, let's what's going on here. Um, uh, I think I think what what really stands out is that Mike Brown remains the same. It'd be interesting to see like right now, for example, you know, not that I'm rooting for this, but but from a storyline standpoint, it would be interesting to see. Let's see the Kings. What happens if the Kings lose four out of their last whatever? Uh, or I think they only have what they only got four games remaining. Four so, games left. Yeah. What if they? You know, they already lost uh, just this last. So let's say they lose um, three of the four. And they and they kind of you know stumble into the the postseason. 
how 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 I prediction I don't think Mike Brown's demeanor changes all that much I think he keeps himself um, especially with the media game I think he remains about as even keeled and as normal as possible now behind the scenes with his players maybe there's a ramp up uh, he's certainly somebody who's going to hold them accountable and point out every deficiency and flaw but also credit every everything that uh, should be worthy of praise so um, I, I would like to see how he reacts for something that you know is a little bit more meaningful or impact not to say that you know a losing streak at the beginning of the season to the end of the season you know you can you can argue that they're all the same but there seems to be more magnitude as you go into the playoffs if they lose two straight in a playoff series how does he change i would imagine that his demeanor would remain uh, about the same and even keel like we've seen different he is fairly even keeled but we've seen in my mind like what we would see if there was that sort of dip in the postseason you know like what we just saw against san antonio i, I think before he walked out sean i was saying like i'm kind of expecting some disappointed dad vibes so I'm, I'm not mad i'm just disappointed and i feel like that's kind of what we got a little bit more uh frustration than that but we've seen him pretty pissed off after that New York game in my mind. Correct me if you guys think there's a oh, different yeah. one, but like I thought that was the most pissed we've seen him. And that was a win. 23 offensive rebounds they gave up, though. I feel like we've seen some different stages of Mike Brown, but it's going to certainly be interesting to see how that changes going into this postseason. And he is, uh, just to echo James's point a bit, like he's probably my favorite person to talk to. Not probably. Between the players that we get and everything, like Coach is my favorite person. To oh, talk outside to of, outside of Outside of me, of course, like I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah, 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 of course. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> blessed to have your number in my phone. It's a different story, you know, um, but no, yeah, to that point, I, I don't I don't mean to call him even keeled as, as if he's not going to um, call a spade a spade. No, he certainly does that. I think what I mean is you're going to see the same Mike Brown that you would see if, if they had won five straight as opposed to if they lose five straight. I think his demeanor like again, he's going to be pointed and he's going to um, he, he's going to call out the bullshit when he sees it. And, and I think that's important. I don't mean to say he's going to go Dave Yeager and not answer the question or maybe be a little bit shorter. Um, I, I think as a whole, he will continue to be himself. And that's what I think I love so much about having a guy like Mike Brown coach this team. You, there's no phoniness there. The, the, everything is very, very genuine. And so I don't want to mistake even keel with someone who's just going to be passive and, to, and, and just, I just mean steady as the court. Like he, I, I said this the other day, like if you're, if you're a fan of this team and you don't seek out his, uh, the videos that we all post, um, to social media after every game or after every practice, you're doing yourself a disservice, man. Cause he is very transparent and very open with his analysis, his kids, criticisms, his, uh, goals for, uh, areas of improvement for not only his team, but his players and just overall strategy. I mean, some of my favorite moments are, believe it or not, come from Brendan when, when he's asking him scheme and, and, and various coaching technique. And he's, especially to practice, man, he's got his arms up in the air. He's getting, he's bringing people in to, to, to diagram a play and show people how to do it. I mean, that's just, it's fun stuff. It may not uh, always land with the right people. Some would call it corny, but it, it you can't call it anything other than genuine. He is always going to be himself. And, and, and that's kind of what I mean with the even keel. And you'll always get a story like once a week, right? What was the latest? Something, well, something involving okay, Popovich? So well, no, but that's the problem. You you called it dad vibe a minute ago. Uh, he's told that story about four or five times already. Yeah, between that <laughs> and what the, the Randy Bennett story, like it's like yeah, okay, man. we got that one. Like we're not writing that one again, Mike. I there almost some, stopped a mid sentence one time. Yeah, I'm just gonna interrupt yeah. you. Uh, we don't want to oh, get that one oh, again. <laughs> oh, you mean the dog pile? Because I literally he said it three times, and on the second time he said it, I I played along as if I hadn't heard it before from him, <laughs> and I wanted to be like, oh yeah, uh, so you. you so the story was he celebrated a playoff or a, a big win with his with his team. I think it was a playoff win. It was he dogpiled with yeah. the Cavaliers. He dogpiled with his players. He had a message from Greg Popovich and he calls him back and he says, "Mikey, if I ever see you do a dogpile again, I'm going to kick your ass." To which I imply, I just retorted and said, "Can he take you?" <laughs> and that was my favorite response of the year. He's like, "Oh hell no." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I, I would put my money on Pop. Pop's a would you? Oh my god! Pop's a military man. You kidding me? 
Pop's a military man. Um, yeah, I think he's been fun. Like that's that's the best part. And you talk about like transparency. Like we had the Alex Len situation, which has just popped up out of nowhere. That Alex Len again, he he had not played at all. Alex is is a very nice guy. I talk to him all the time in the locker room. He's just hanging out, like and like he was comfortable. Like he keeps working. We see him every pregame. We all watch. Him and Jay Triano. Jay Triano throws these behind the back passes and all these funny things. And it's like this running thing where we get to watch Jay Triano like try to do different wild passes. So Alex is prepared for like a hot potato play, which I still don't think Alex is always prepared for. Um, but like we got to practice the other day and it was like, hey, can you explain the Alex Lynn situation? Because if I'm Chimesi Metu, I'm over here like, man, I hope you win 47 games. And all of a sudden I'm just out in the cold. And that's the answer is yes. Like he sat there and went through like Alex stayed ready. He was prepared. He's a good teammate. He's a veteran leader and he's got tremendous size. And so we're going to give Alex a, a shot here. And he did, of course, he said this earlier in the season with Namias Keda, but he said the, like basically the phrase of death, yeah, he's going to be our, our backup center for, for right now. And so I, I thought it was interesting, but then I follow up like, hey, is this potential matchups like in the playoffs and stuff? Or like, and it's like, no, he just, everyone deserves a shot. So Alex is getting a shot. And so and, I, and the games aren't meaningful. No, yeah, I they're, they're not. And I still think Trey Lyles will probably be the guy who plays the backup center right. in the playoffs. Um, unless it's against the Warriors, because for some reason, Chemezi Metu seems to be like Warriors kryptonite. I'm not sure what it is, but like he's, oh? Played, he's, oh? he, he's helped the, uh, <laughs> the Kings come back against the Warriors multiple times this season. Um, but I don't know, like bulletin it, board material. <laughs> there it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> they're they're going to put bulletin board material from our podcast about, yep about Chimezi Metu being Steve uh, Kerr's like tonight. you believe what these guys are talking about look at this shit <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah okay so let's finish up um I don't I don't know well let's do the business of basketball the business of basketball there we go yes. okay um you know we we all season long we're looking at like all stars for Fox and Sabonis they get there. We're we're thinking about like rookie of the year for uh for Keegan Murray, which isn't going to happen. But first team All NBA for sure, uh, All rookie uh, for sure. We, we've debated the merits of um of Fox and Sabonis for All NBA nods as well. And uh, the one guy who's played every single game for the Sacramento Kings this year, seventy eight straight is Harrison Barnes. And uh, this week and, and last week, and the last two weeks, he's been given, he's nominated for both like the NBA Community Award and for the Teammate of the Year Award, which I think the Teammate of the Year Award, which is a Twyman Stokes uh, Award, which I'm not sure if everyone knows of Jack Twyman and Maurice uh, Stokes uh, story. That's a, It's tied to Sacramento because it was when uh, the Kings were in Cincinnati. There was Cincinnati Royals. Um, Maurice Stokes fell and hit his head on the court and got an infection and had a major stroke and basically was paralyzed for the rest of his life. And his teammate, Jack Twyman, uh, did nothing but fundraise and actually uh, became his legal guardian and took care of him until he died at age like 36. So uh, but Harrison Barnes is this guy that like we've covered forever, uh, and he he's getting some props for the things that Harrison Barnes should get props for, which is not just being a good basketball player, but being a good citizen and being a great teammate. Um, where are you guys at with Harrison? Uh, like we're seeing, are we seeing the last four games of regular season games of Harrison Barnes in Sacramento? Are we seeing the last hurrah, or do you think that? like things have changed enough here uh, this season and that Harrison will be a guy that, that maybe sticks around for three or four more years. Yeah. Well, you also, you also forgot the, <clears throat> the league sportsmanship award. So uh, you get six finalists, one yeah, from each division or whatever sportsmanship that was. sportsmanship. Yeah. So he's the representative from the Pacific division. Oh. Um, and 
you know, there's he's one of six, and that's a league a league award, and he could likely take that home. But yeah, I, I look his contributions are stuff that go beyond box scores. Um, the, the, the the role he plays on this team is very specific and he's happy to do so he's also a member of the players association executive council so players around the league he is always available to them and is a is kind of that lightning rod throughout the league so um it, it's it's a very important piece that not only plays for this team but throughout the nba and he wears it well man i, I every time i see him it, it's a it i call him you know senator barnes because uh, the guy could run for office one day if he wanted to, uh, if he chose to do so, and not say he will, but um, he 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 moves and shakes like a like a the things you would like from a politician. I know some people cringe at that oh, as we man. lose James. Oh, James, James didn't like what I had to say, so he just left the podcast. But that's okay <laughs> for the audio listener. We continue to go with Brendan for the video listener here on YouTube. James is back. There he goes. It was only like a few seconds. But yeah, the things you would like from a politician, the good things that they do without the slimy, cringy, gross stuff that tends to trickle into politics. That's uh, that's what Harrison Barnes is. I think you very often hear people say like, well, whatever he would run for, I would vote for him. Like he, he just seems like a great person that is always looking for the best interest in for everyone around him always talked about how he's such a great teammate there's never been any sort of you know reported issue or like notable unhappiness with Harrison Barnes or anything and he's been here through some hard times in Sacramento and to James's question of could he stick around when you know years prior it felt like okay well you should probably move him because he's gonna walk for nothing why would he stay I think it's changed enough that I could absolutely see him sticking around. We'll we'll see what he ends up deciding to do this offseason, obviously, but I think circumstances have changed enough. I think they've made it clear the importance that he has to this team that I, I could see a world where he ends up sticking around in Sacramento, and I, I would hope that he does. Yeah, me too. Like, I, Harrison has been... I actually, like, I asked a bonus about Harrison the other day, and he said... Like, he's the most professional teammate he's ever been around. Like, he's always prepared. He's always the first one there. He's always the last one to leave. He's the guy that everyone relies on. He does mean a tremendous amount to the locker room. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that things have changed, but I'm not sure 100%. Like, we're going to have to wait and see how it works out this summer. Um, okay, lastly, uh, CBA stuff. Have you guys been keeping up with all the CBA stuff? Kind of. Little. <laughs> Is there anything that stands out? Like, I, I, like, always, they, they always, like, dangle the, hey, we're going to end the one and done. We're going to end it. And then they never do. It's always, like, a negotiating tactic. And I'm not even sure who really wants the one and done, like, done away with. Uh, but, uh, like, there's a couple of things that I think are meaningful to the Kings um, as far as, like, the way that they're going to penalize these heavy spenders, uh, like the Golden State Warriors, like the Los Angeles Clippers, who just go above and beyond? They're gonna, uh, they're gonna put some things in place that will limit uh, the buyout market. Which again, we've talked about. Like the Kings just aren't part of the buyout market, unless they're buying someone out and letting them go play somewhere else. But they've never really been able to go out and be a player in that market, and that's going to be limited uh, again. Uh, the you know mid level exception, all these things. Uh, and then probably the biggest thing that may come into play with the Kings, but I don't think so, is that uh, they're opening up this door where Sabonis can actually sign for 140% of his contract from next season, as opposed to the 120% that he can sign for. Uh, that's still not enough. Like in the grand scheme of things, um, there's a way that they that they can give Sabonis more money, but and this certainly would help that, um, but it still doesn't seem like it's enough. So I'm not sure. But anyway, well, even in his in his circumstance too, if he's all NBA third team as also being an All Star, that'll qualify him for max, right? Like even a bigger max. He has to do it two year. Well, he has to do it next year as well. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, it's in the previous year. So yeah, and, and I mean, but that's what it's going to come down to. Do you think? So bonus is going to push for max money. Yeah. You, you think he's going to try to be super max? Yeah. He has to, because look, 
th- this is his this is his this is his contract in the prime of his career and if he didn't and he tried to cut you know like some corners just to do his team a, a, a favor which he won't uh the players association would kill him <laughs> so uh no you go and get that money that's the that's the name of the game and I'll say this. I lean on you a lot of that stuff. You understand it a lot better than I do. Um, I do tend to read and and, um, bounce a lot of scenarios off of uh, people I know and trust. But um, my biggest takeaway, there were two things, if if I'm being honest, is uh, the play-in tournament is coming. uh, Or not the play-in tournament, excuse me. The mid-season tournament is coming. I'm not a fan of of it, per se. Um, I think I have to see it. I honestly don't think it's necessary, and I think it's being done as a way f- to appease television networks with the television contract coming up. Uh, they're obviously going to be asking for more money, as rightfully so. Uh, television contracts are, are broadcasting rights are crazy. Uh, you could, I mean, there's a world where you could see NBC step in. You might see Fox step in. You could see somebody else step in and steal the the television contract away from ABC, ESPN. That setting that aside, I think everyone knows that the NBA doesn't really officially begin until Christmas time, and that the mid the mid season tournament, if you will, would happen to bring a lot more eyes. I don't think it's true. I think it's too gimmicky. But I also think you don't people aren't paying attention to you because football's going on, uh, and football is being spread out more and more over the course of. The, the, the week as it is, it's not just for Sundays and Mondays anymore. You see Thursdays, you sometimes see Saturdays. So um, there are opportunities for football to exist. College football is still going on. Uh, no one pays attention to college basketball until college football is over. And baseball basically winds up and uh, finishes up in late October, early November in some cases. So uh, I don't think it'll have the desired effect. I think it's too gimmicky and it's not something that I'm really looking forward to. Um, but I'm one person. I don't know where you guys fall on that. It's just not something that I think will benefit the league that much. I Hmm. think it's lame. I don't really understand why players are going to be incentivized. If it's some money, like, is it, I, I don't know why players are going to be incentivized to feel like a sense of pride and like accomplishment for have won this new tournament that never existed before um and to me it it would be more so teams that don't really have a shot of winning the championship that maybe feel locked in as it's something they can go and win i just it's weird to me i think that adding new things also messes with like conversations that are fun but also admittedly pointless when you're trying to compare legacies and things like that um but we'll see i was extremely skeptical to play in and as we talked about earlier that is has worked out well i think the main thing that stood out to me in the cba uh changes is that now there's a hard line for all nba teams it's going to be 65 games and that's for all award for all post for all awards like oh you're right just the yeah it's all major individual league awards yeah wow yeah yeah um yeah, I, I don't having a hard line is weird to me. And if you did have a hard line, make it a little lower. I, I think like 60 ish makes sense to me. 65 is a lot, man. I, I get that you want it to be players that obviously have participated in the good majority of the year, but 65 seems high to me. The one that's confusing is that you'll have these this hard line for awards, as you as you pointed out. But yet the all star game, which does impact if you're an all, an all star, it does impact contractual stuff uh later on I like mean, what you said was sabonis yeah. correct so there should be a minimum of there as well in my opinion um they should establish a minimum games to be uh considered Eligible. for all-star game yeah there might be a percentage or something that they're they're working on there uh, like we haven't seen the whole details of everything um and I, like i'm kind of with brendan like 65 seems like an arbitrary number I like even if you put it like 62 where you you could miss up to 20 games what they're trying to do there though it's not just like mess with the the season awards is that they're trying to force players to actually play the games and and so we stop having this rest issue right so if a player gets deep in the season like man 
you know, fans came out. They bought tickets to see a Kawhi Leonard. They bought tickets to see some of these players. And the fact that they're not getting that opportunity to see them is is kind of a big deal. Um, yeah, and so I did the math. Just so, Huge deal, by the way. Huge yeah, deal. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, how many times have we seen major players not play in Sacramento? Like, I did not uh, appreciate Adam Silver's um, dismissal uh, at All-Star Weekend of that topic. He basically said, oh, our ratings are up, our blah, blah, blah is up. And it's like, no, man, that's a big problem. That's a big problem that your league has, especially, yeah. and it potentially could get worse. Like, this is a this is a thing you need to nip in the bud very, very quickly. And I think this is a way to do that. And look, you're talking 12 games, you know, right? 82 to 65, that's, I'm, I'm not good at math, but that's, that's 12 games, right? <laughs> no, that's 17. Sorry, 17, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Sorry. 82 to 65 that's 17 yeah, yeah. 17 My 70 bad. would be 12 games sean that's where it is okay <laughs> i'm not good at numbers so anyway uh <laughs> yeah uh, th- look that that's still not that many especially considering how injuries play a, a factor in games and yeah they want to you know you, you talk about malik monk who just has this little flare-up and, and and it's not something that's considered serious but could pe- could potentially keep him out three to four games yeah and, you know, like even Fox has played, I think he's missed eight games this season. So he's on pace for 74 games. Like, and it, that's, so he's missed 10% of the season. If you start missing, like, I don't know what percentage-wise 65 games is, well, it's it's right around 20%, give or take a, a percentage point. If you're missing 20% of the season, I'm not sure that you should be up for awards or 25% if we would get down to like 60 games. So, and real quick, like what we were talking about with Sabonis. Um, so Sabonis is salary, and this is going to be like a weird gray area because um, the NBA looks at two, looks at bonuses in two different ways. Either there's like a easily obtainable or a not very easily obtainable goal. So for the Kings, so if they had a player and let's say De'Aaron Fox has a, a, um, a bonus in his contract that says that if the Kings win the NBA championship, he gets 2 million bucks. That's not an easily obtainable goal. But for Sabonis, if his two point, I think it's $2.4 million that he has in bonus money for making the all-star team, and, but it's all-star and all NBA and it's split down the middle. So he gets like 1.2 for making an all-star team and 1.2 for making all NBA. If those two, things are added to his salary which does impact the king's salary cap his projected salary for next season goes from like 19.4 million which it is right now to like almost 22 million and then if you start doing the math off the 22 million and you start looking at that that 140 percent that they can project out it gets you up to i don't know if it's like 30 something million but the way the nba works is we saw it with miles turner this year you can actually give somebody, you can bump their salary up if you have salary cap space. So there's somewhere where the Kings have salary cap space. They could conceivably give Sabonis a raise to say $25 million or $28 million or whatever it would be. And then they can give him give him an extension off of that dollar amount, which is a big deal. So I did the math and... If the Kings were able to get Sabonis up to a $25 million salary for this year, they could offer him a five-year extension starting at $35 million a year. So it'd be like 35, uh, 37.8, 40.8, 44.1, and 47.6. Sean, would you think that Sabonis would consider a five-year $210 million extension? Uh, no. I, I no. You still think it's more? Yeah, I think he stands to make more on the open market, and but if he gets injured, true in the in the full season, plus he would make an additional five million dollars in the in the year. So so it would be like bumping the salary up now. So it'd be realistically like a two hundred and ten million dollar total extension. You still it's think that's money. not enough? <laughs> not not At least in worth offering, right? Not in it. Oh yeah, you got to. Put it, put a nice bow on it, and I don't know, bring a bring the whole team to his doorstep and with food and favors and all this stuff. I mean, sure, do that, but hmm. uh, 
I don't know, man. It's gonna it, uh, if they if they did what a what a coup what a coup that they pulled off to get the extension before he hits the open market. Um, that'd be amazing. Brendan, what do you think? I think yes, probably no. not, but you try. Like I I think that Domas is gonna get every dollar of the max that is available to him, and I I think he should. But from Sacramento's perspective, you try that number, and it's not like a zero percent chance maybe there's there's a very small chance that it could work it's not it's a lot of money it's a lot of money yeah also i don't want to point paint a picture in case the the average fan who's listening who doesn't know the difference and they go he'd turn that down what a greedy piece of shit Like, like like it's it's his obligation as an nba player they have a union um they they he would get pushed back on a lot by people within the union to to if he if he did that that so i don't want it to make it look like oh he's greedy he's going for all the cash that's the way the system is designed that's the way the players association would want somebody of his caliber to do that to pave the way for others right yeah no I, i'm with you i'm with you now i would also like consider like this is a deal that they're putting in place for specifically like sabonis so is mentioned in every report when it comes to this particular point in the CBA, the new CBA. And they, they like give the number for Sabonis. And it's it's a joke. It's like he'd go from $111 million to $133 million deal. And you're like, okay, that $20 million is not going to be enough. But if you match that with a salary increase as part of an increase and extend, then yeah. I, I mean, I think he's, I think he's going to listen for sure. And if the Kings have enough salary space... Maybe you can go a little higher than that. I'm not sure. I'd have to also do the math on what he would project out as a super max contract. I was but, just going to ask, yeah, if he ends up being all star again, all NBA player, then what? Like, does that like what's the escalation there? Well, the super max is based off of um, like a percentage of the salary cap. So because he would be able to get the super max if if he actually had the. Um, if he's all NBA again, two years in a row, I believe he would qualify and you can make up to 30% of the salary cap. So if the salary cap, it's at what, 132 this year, uh, it'll be at 145 or 150 next year. That's a starting salary of roughly $45 million a year. So, and then eight, and then 8% raises on top of that. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, but you also know what you do to your team when you take those deals and how much that impacts your ability to go sign other players and all that stuff. And so, I don't know. At some point, you got to wonder how much money does one person need, um, but you don't begrudge anyone for getting as much as they can. Because uh, hey, Get it's that there. coin. That and, you know, he's six foot ten, six foot eleven. Like, when he's done playing basketball, it's not like life is super easy. He doesn't fit through doorways. He doesn't fit in most cars. Like... <laughs> These are things, you know, life expectancy is shorter. Like, there are a lot of things he, that go into being that tall. He doesn't have the problem his dad has. Oh, my gosh. What a monster. That's a huge man. That That's is, a huge man. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Do we have any final thoughts? Brendan, let's start with you. Brendan, what do you got? Final thoughts. A healthy Brendan. We've got him back. Uh, I am proud of Kawhi Leonard for playing in his first back-to-back in two years. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. First one in two years is crazy. And I'm just tired of players not playing second nights of back-to-backs or resting for X, Y, or Z that, yeah, I'm just glad that he's glad that he's playing. Yeah. Think about that. You're you're talking about someone make, you know, James was talking about the possibility of Domas making 45, nearly $50 million per season. And then (laughs) Brennan's like, I'm glad that this guy's finally playing in back-to-backs. Like this is again, the, 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 (laughs) This, the, the the expectation that you should have of these people who have make so much crazy money. Um, no, my final thoughts definitely not basketball related. Hey, Rivercats uh, opening day, and it's weird. Fernando Fernando Tatis is going to be in Sacramento rehabbing with the El Paso team, who is the Padres uh, AAA uh, affiliate. AAA affiliate, and he's coming back off of a PED suspension. So, yeah, man, Sutter mm. Health Park might be the uh, place to be in the next few days. Have you been keeping up with the uh, the Republic? 
I have, um, we actually have a, today of all days, we actually have a 30-minute special on the Republic beginning their U.S. Open Cup tournament, the one that they took all the way down to Orlando and the looking to take down their third MLS team. They fell short in that championship, but yeah, we did a did a nice little feature or a nice little thirty minute special on uh, the quest for the cup, as they call it. So hopefully they don't get bounced tonight, or tomorrow, I should say, because they open up against a team from like Redmond, Oregon, so they're or Washington, which is like below them. It's not a USL team, but if anybody knows what the U.S. Open Cup is, it's all competitive professional soccer in the U.S. get put into a tournament, and then you work your way down. So they made it all the way to the championship at one point. The The goal is from what I'm told is always to be the last USL team standing. And then you get, you know, significant reward for that. Okay. And see, this is why I think the NBA is looking at the end in game, the end season tournament. It, it just, because of soccer way to go soccer. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you look at uh, like the EPL in Europe, they, they have all kinds of cups. They have two separate cups during season. And so you'll play games that matter for one thing and games that matter for your regular standings. This is different because it will count for both your regular season standings and the cup standings. So they're not going to have extra games in season. They'll just be games that count towards something to towards both things. So a regular Tuesday night game between the Kings and the Pelicans can have more uh, like oomph to it than just a standard game. So maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, but I think either way it should be it should be interesting. I don't know much about soccer, but I can tell you this. The Republic are bringing back 16 players from last season. And I know from covering enough high school sports and football, when you have returning players, that bodes well for team success. So they're, they've got some depth. I think they have a lot of high hopes for this season. Interesting. Yeah, I've got to get out to a game. Uh, final thoughts from James. Um Nothing. I don't think I have any final thoughts. It's sunny. Outside. I see that sunshine hitting you in the eye, so it's, that's a good it's, thing. It's like coming right off the lake and coming in the window and like hitting me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, come on, sun. That's. I would like to start my garden, and we keep having all these freezing days, and that's not a good way to start a garden. So I'm hoping that uh, we're we're coming close to the end of frozen days. I know, like yesterday, the day before, it started snowing. Like what in the world? Like totally bizarre. Like, it's April. It's April. Stop snowing. <laughs> like, what is happening? So, all right. Uh, well, that's going to do it for this edition of the King Speed Podcast. Um, if you're still watching, give us a rating and review. Give us a thumbs up. Uh, do all those cool things. Oh, I am wearing a new shirt. Um, oh, I'll put these oh. on the side. So they're just like a long sleeve version of the white tank. Uh, I mean, the white, uh, the white hoodie, but they're pretty cool. Um, so get yourself one of those on the King's Beat uh, merch shop. Um, Brendan, I know you're not. I know you're not a movie guy. Are you going to see the movie Air? Because it's basketball related. Yes, I probably will see that. Oh, really? Probably. Probably. I saw John Wick yesterday. What did you think? I thought it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah. thought it was good. Like, it's a lot of like me and the the 15 year old went and hung out and and it's watched a long it. movie. It's very long, um, but yeah, we just, it was just us and like two other people in the movie theater, like on a matinee on a Monday afternoon. No spoilers, but staircase scene might be my favorite. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. No, I, um, I saw Chris Tucker over the weekend, and oh. he's in the movie Air. So, uh, shout out him. He was very very fun. So, uh, he was at the Hard Rock Sacramento, which is nowhere near Sacramento. <laughs> it's up in Marysville, basically. Yeah, but way out. that was that was fun fun times. All right. Okay. Well, I think that's yeah. going to do it. Uh, give us a rating review. Subscribe to the King's Beat. Go to thekingsbeat.com. Like. like. Thumbs Almost up. All, what, all of those things. Like, just go ahead and do them all, uh, if you don't mind. And uh, we'll see you later this week for another edition of the King's Beat podcast. So for Fox 40, Sean Cunningham, and Brenda Nunes from the King's Pulse podcast, I'm James Ham, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. See ya.